Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Jackson, as introduced. Uh, and uh, I want to emphasize at the very beginning that I'm not selling anything. Uh, the tutorial is available for free uh, on our uh, uh, SUTD ESD website. I'll give you a link to the tutorial at the, at the end of the talk. Uh, it's, uh, I developed the tutorial for our uh, students, our undergraduate engineering students. Uh, we've used it for two years now, and actually I enhanced it uh, quite a bit this past year. Um, and uh, it dates back to uh, the NCOSI uh, conference in uh, uh, Adelaide, Australia in 2017, where I first saw Capella uh, being demonstrated there. I got quite excited and immediately adopted it uh, for our, our uh, educational curriculum. So in, uh, uh, in what I'd like to accomplish this evening is uh, basically to uh, give you a backstory as, as to how I came to Capella and what I'm trying to accomplish uh, using Capella as part of our educational program. Uh, and then that leads to the, uh, the style of the tutorial, uh, the simplicity of the tutorial, and uh, you can then understand if, as you work through it, what, what the context is, what, what we were trying to accomplish with it. Uh, it, it may not match uh, your particular needs or uses of Capella, uh, but we've heard from a number of folks in industry that uh, uh, for people getting an introduction to Capella, it, it works quite well because it's, uh, it's at a, a fairly simple level, but but works through a number of the key features of the software tool, and I think uh, reinforces the, uh, the development process, the Arcadia uh, development process as it goes. Okay, so if, if I could spend some time giving a background as to why, uh, why I've chosen Capella and why I got excited by it, uh, I'll start off with systems engineering. Uh, because I, uh, when I was at Cornell University, I joined a, an ad hoc group of faculty uh, that wanted to create a, a new program in systems engineering at Cornell. Uh, we had been asked by industry to, to start uh, producing graduates, uh, master's students who understood uh, systems engineering. So I got involved uh, in systems engineering uh, roughly 20 years ago. And at that time, there were very long definitions of systems engineering. Uh, some of the short definitions were uh, like uh, I had my colleagues say, well, uh, systems engineering is what you need to design complex systems. And while that's true, it, it bothered me a bit because I don't think uh, it shouldn't be the case that when we design a system, we don't start out to make it a complex system. Uh, I think our goal as designers would be to make the system as simple as possible to meet the need. However, the needs that we're dealing with are quite complex. And so in my definition of systems engineering, it's the, uh, uh, the process, uh, can I move this window out of the way? Uh, uh, it's the process by which we understand a complex need and then uh, I, I put two uh, uh, targets for us. One, we want it to be an elegant uh, solution that we come up with, uh, but also a harmonious solution. And that gets at uh, the concept that when you put a new system into place, you want it to interface uh, with existing systems uh, uh, as well as possible. Uh, so, that, uh, so both elegance and harmony become the touch points uh, for a systems engineer. Uh, so I quite like uh, that definition rather than uh, the fact that we're trying to create complex systems. Uh, okay. Now, uh, as as I developed, uh, as we developed a curriculum in systems engineering at Cornell, I started meeting architects and other people who were at uh, the the very front end of the design process, and I, I began to appreciate that there was some there was a part of systems engineering. Uh, that really focused on uh, the conceptual design 
And uh, eventually, uh, as others have, uh, began calling that system architecting. Uh, so systems architecting is part of systems engineering, because systems engineering is a design process. Uh, but systems engineering or systems architecting is really that upfront conceptual process where you're making some of the major decisions, uh, chunking the design uh, into uh, logical components uh, and uh, setting basic mission and, and use cases that are going to drive uh, the subsequent detailed design. So uh, from that point, systems engineering also carries on and goes through a full life cycle, uh, uh, detailed design, building, testing, deploying, uh, recovering, uh, uh, recycling, and so on. So uh, the systems architecting is the upfront uh, design, uh, system design component uh, of systems engineering. The other thing that uh, in the early uh, 2000s that I be became aware of is the move towards model-based systems engineering, MBSE is the abbreviation. Uh, and the arguments given for model-based systems engineering is to say we've had systems engineering uh, for, for half a century. If you look back into the uh, systems engineering, in my mind, really took off in the 1950s. Uh, with the, the design of nuclear submarines. Those were, uh, you know, vast, complex systems uh, and, uh, you know, mountains of documents were needed to describe uh, those systems. So we've had document-centered, document-centric systems engineering for decades. Uh, what was new about uh, uh, the beginning of this century is the move, the push towards making it model-based. And that's analogous to what's happened in uh, uh, all other engineering disciplines, uh, the sort of move from drafting and, and hand drawing uh, descriptions of products into computer aided design and manufacturing. And so the benefits uh, that uh, you would expect uh, to have with uh, the model based approach in computer aided design, uh, there's the hope that the same kinds of benefits would show up in systems engineering. Uh, I, I like this diagram. I got it from Lockheed Martin. It's a list of uh, a great many documents that they end up producing as part of a systems engineering exercise. Uh, you'll, uh, I don't know if you can read the font, but in the upper left, uh, you're starting with an operational needs statement uh, and then dozens of documents, and then you're getting down to project schedules, cost breakdown, structures and, and project budgets at, at the bottom right. So that gives you some sense for a basic scope of uh, designing a system, all of the documents that have to come together. But the vision of model-based systems engineering is that uh, instead of the focus being on the documents, you have a system model in the, uh, in the center, a database essentially that's capturing all of the data, all of the relationships, and once it's in a database form, then all sorts of other things become possible. So you can generate your documents. That's in the lower left of this diagram. Uh, you can generate your documents with a push of a button. Uh, that if you want your operational needs statement, you should be able to push a button, and that would that would get kicked out for you. And as you make revisions, uh, it would be automatically updated. Uh, version control, configuration management can all be done, can all be computerized. Uh, so uh, as you change your requirement, it can uh, uh, immediately result in a, uh, uh, a new issue of, of the fundamental documents. Uh, but again, beyond that, if you have a systems model, then there's the potential for, for simulation models, for analytical studies, uh, and the reuse possibilities that you can pull uh, previously designed components out of a library and stick that into your systems model. Okay, so these were the uh, the initial uh, hopes of model-based systems engineering. Uh, Sandy Friedenthal was a champion uh, of, of this whole development effort and uh, uh, argued that it would be a more rigorous way of capturing data. Uh, there would be clearer communications between different organizations. Uh, because you would have precise uh, definitions that didn't change, uh, so the glossary would be well-defined, 
and automatically uh, carried over from one diagram to another uh, and other benefits that are listed here. And the sort of holy grail was this last one, the, the knowledge transfer, uh, the hope that there would be libraries uh, start to, to be developed that uh, means you could reuse uh, uh, key components from, uh, from previous studies uh, in your current projects. Okay, so those, uh, that was sort of the, the big push. Uh, there were a number of different tools, uh, commercial tools and open source tools becoming available in the early 2000s. Uh, the one that uh, it, it, uh, sort of took over uh, around, uh, you know, the late uh, you know, 2010, I think, uh, I was starting to see really serious large-scale models uh, being developed with SysML. And so I, I sort of at that point recognized it was probably going to win the race of modeling languages. So SysML stands for Systems Modeling Language. Uh, it's built, uh, it's an extension of UML, the Unified Modeling Language, which came out of the software engineering field. Uh, but there were a number of things with UML that were inadequate uh, to really cover systems engineering. And so SysML became in part a superset, uh, but also had some specialized uh, uh, changes to UML. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so SysML, I think, has, has really taken off. It's been endorsed by a number of professional societies. I've noticed uh, uh, industry is using it on progressively larger projects. Uh, commercial vendors have gotten behind it. There, there are a number of commercial solutions uh, that you can use. And uh, for education Peter, purposes, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm going to interrupt you, but uh, uh, it seems we we still see the slide five. Um, I don't know oh, why. really? I suppose okay. it's not, uh, <laughs> that's what you intended to do. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I wonder why that's not refreshing. I'm on slide 10. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I don't I don't know what what I'm doing wrong at this point. Um, if I if I stopped sharing and you showed the slides, then no, I could go okay. into advance. Could we try that? Yeah, sure. Okay. So uh, you have a copy of the slides. I've stopped sharing. Um, participant, I think uh, you could you could take it and uh, step us through the slides uh, five through ten. Uh, okay, J just uh, stop share, share to sharing and then we try to share. I assume it will uh, it will work. Uh, I did stop sharing at my end. Okay, so it's frozen. <laughs> uh, well, okay, so I'll try to slide, so. Maybe you can try to change the presenter. Yeah, in the meantime. Um, where is it? Oh, uh, so it looks like I still have sharing rights. OK, so I will share my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, will you restart from slide five or maybe in the one? Yes, yeah, so if you go to slide five, but I'm not seeing your screen here. Uh, oh, I'm supposed to share my screen? Yes. With everyone, so. Yes, we can see your screen, Daniel. Uh, I'm afraid that it's uh, a problem from your side, Professor Jackson. Under under participant, uh, there's a button where you reclaim the host role. Maybe. Uh, 
Okay. If it's disturbing for you, maybe we can try to give you the, the presenter role again. Instead, it, it seems I'm sharing. Oh, okay, that's slide. okay. Now uh, something changed. So I'm seeing a black screen. Do you want me to switch the presenter? Mm -hmm. Is it still black on your side? It's still black on my side. Uh, okay, uh, so okay, I will try to reassign you as a presenter and see if it would be better. Uh, uh, Professor Jackson, you just have to have the slide by your side uh, on your laptop and so I, don't, don't worry the, about the WebEx. The, okay, so I'm the presenter again? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, let me, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see if there's a different way of sharing it. Yeah, share the application. Okay, let's see if this is any better. Okay, that's that's fine. We can see this. So that's slide five. five. Yes. Uh, oops, how do I advance? Okay, so yes, that's fine now. We can see slide so, seven. Okay, slide seven puts the systems model uh, at the center, yeah. uh, database, which then you can uh, use to generate documents and do analytical work. Uh, benefits of uh, MBSE listed here uh, from Sandy Friedenthal. And uh, then I uh, introduced SysML as the systems model language. Uh, and that's, and then uh, the argument uh, on slide 10 that uh, SysML has uh, quite a large following now. Uh, it's backed up by professional societies as well as industry using it for fairly large projects and a lot of very mature software for it. Okay, so are you seeing my screen? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, this is working? Okay, great. Okay. So again, I don't want to spend too much time on SysML, but uh, it, just to put it in context, it uh, is organized around uh, what, what they've called four pillars of SysML. Uh, the, the, the pillar behavior uh, is, and the pillar structure are mostly uh, diagrams from the unified modeling language. So this, uh, those two components come out of the software engineering world. Uh, but they weren't adequate for systems engineering. And so the, uh, for the systems engineering community, they've added the requirements diagram, the requirements component, and then uh, in a rather unique uh, extension to UML, they've added a parametric diagram, which basically allows you to describe systems of equations. Uh, so now with systems of equations, you can do parametric uh, descriptions of models. Uh, uh, so, for example, you could describe the wheelbase. You could have a parameter being the wheelbase of an automobile, uh, but then relative to that wheelbase, you describe the uh, dimensions for the uh, uh, passenger compartment and the, uh, the, the engine compartment and so on. And so then as you scale the wheelbase, uh, everything else in the design will scale as well with it. Uh, so the parametric diagram, the, the uh, equation modeling, uh, was a key addition uh, to SysML uh, to meet the needs of systems engineering. Okay, and there, this is a classic diagram that behavior is allocated to structure. Uh, requirements are satisfied by structure, but you bind uh, the structure to the parametrics, and the parametrics then allow you to verify that the requirements are being met. So. Those are key concepts from systems engineering and SysML. 
Okay, so that brings us, so I had developed uh, tutorials for students uh, when I was at Cornell University. We did lots of projects uh, trying to extend and do analytical work with SysML. Uh, but when I was faced, uh, when I came to Singapore to SUTD, Singapore University of Technology and Design, I wanted to bring formal design in the, in the sense of systems architecting uh, into our undergraduate curriculum. Uh, so I didn't want a full course in systems engineering. That, uh, that struck me as uh, uh, too much to attempt with uh, our undergraduate students uh, because they haven't had much industrial experience at the, the time they'd be taking this course. Uh, but I still wanted it to be a core class that every ESD, Engineering Systems and Design student, would get exposed to at SUTD. So I was trying to think of, you know, I, I couldn't uh, bear the thought of trying to do SysML with these students because, uh, you know, to get into the parametric diagram and, and all these other uh, kinds of uh, specialties with SysML. I thought it would it would be far too much for the the purpose of the course. Uh, so really, I wanted systems engineering to be left more for graduate study, and uh, focus on design principles and design techniques that we could give our undergraduate students. So that's that's in, that takes us to 2017 when I was really hungry for a tool that was simpler than SysML because uh, I really thought that sys SysML would be overkill uh, if all I wanted to teach was systems architecture. So then I was absolutely delighted at the NCOSI meeting when I, when I saw, I think it was Stéphane uh, Bonnet who was there and demonstrating Capella, and I uh, said, that's perfect. Uh, it's open source. That's exactly what, what we want to uh, be able to use with our students. Okay, so that, uh, that was my journey through SysML and, and the discovery of Capella. So now let me uh, introduce what Capella is trying to do. Uh, uh, first off, we're, we're dealing with a subset of systems engineering. So if you think about what the systems architecture documents would be, uh, you, would, you would still want something like an operational needs statement. Uh, you would want uh, you would want to have your basic hardware specs, software specs, uh, interface specs, and an uh, understanding of how the human interface is going to work with your system. Uh, so all of that is still uh, sort of part of your design, but you're not going to do all of these other uh, activities as part of systems architecting that are really systems engineering functions. Uh, so again, uh, uh, now I'm now I'm a student. I'm trying to learn what uh, uh, Capella is all about, and Capella is a modeling language for systems architecture, uh, but it's built uh, explicitly using a process, a design process called Arcadia, and Arcadia uh, takes uh, the user uh, or guides the uh, the designer through. A uh, series of at least four steps, actually five in the in the full implementation, uh, but all the way from operational analysis through systems analysis into the chunking of a design into a logical architecture, and then finally expressing that uh, as a physical architecture. So there's a process, but then there's also a tool that conforms and reinforces that process, and the tool is Capella. Uh, so you, uh, you're probably familiar with this diagram. I've stolen it from uh, the Capella website uh, that tries to indicate what those four basic uh, functions are. Uh, it's uh, been a, a adopted by uh, Talos, and uh, so there are you know very serious applications uh, being conducted uh, using this tool. And so that gave me the encouragement that this, uh, this probably was going to be a, an industry valuable tool and not just an academic exercise. Uh, so if just to uh, briefly describe the Arcadia process, and again, if you visited uh, the Capella websites, you'd have some understanding of this. Uh, but as I'm taking my students through this process, I, I'm saying you know, the first thing you're doing is not thinking about the system, you're thinking about what your users need. 
so we, we teach our students uh, about journey maps where you try to do a day in the life of your user and uh, think through how they, uh, uh, you know, if, if somebody's taking a visit to the zoo, what, what are all the uh, process steps they have to go through to get their family uh, to the zoo. And, uh, and then you come in with systems analysis and say, well, you know, how could a system improve the experience for the user? Uh, what kind of capabilities could uh, the system provide uh, that truly enhance and meet the operational needs of the, uh, uh, of the user? So now you start thinking of uh, how you can use smartphones to enhance the experience of the, uh, the people visiting the zoo and so on. Uh, but those, uh, but systems analysis just keeps the simple fairly, or keeps the system fairly simple, uh, but tries to identify how uh, it meets the needs of the user. So there's this user system analysis that's really taking place in that second mode. The third mode is now where you look at the complexity of all the functions that the system has to provide, start organizing and chunking them into a, a logical design, a logical architecture. And then finally, the, the final step is to say, okay, now uh, uh, set the logical architecture aside. What are the physical uh, uh, components going to be that will actually implement all of this. And then now you're doing another mapping from the logical architecture to the physical. And at that point, you've probably got a, a well-defined uh, uh, structure for the design that you can now turn over for more detailed design. And now you're leaving the architecture, the systems architecting phase, and entering detailed design. Okay? So those, uh, so that's my students can understand or appreciate that, uh, that level of uh, uh, description of the process. Okay, so just briefly why, uh, uh, why I was excited by Capella. Uh, I did actually like the fact uh, that it, it enforced a methodology. Uh, so SysML, and we could, we could have arguments back and forth on this, uh, but SysML is explicitly agnostic in terms of what methodology you use. It's a, uh, it's a straight, uh, it's a, an attempt to say how would you describe a system and what are all the elements you would need and the relations you would need uh, to adequately describe a system and how you get the, to that description is up to you. Uh, so there's no sense of a process for developing a SysML model. Uh, it's just uh, uh, you figure out your own way uh, through the process. So uh, when uh, using SysML with students, I would have to teach them a process uh, as well as teach them a tool. And it's, I think it's rather nice uh, from an educational viewpoint that uh, Capella has chosen explicitly to follow this Arcadia process. Uh, it makes it uh, a lot easier. I think the learning curve is, is not as steep uh, as you will find with something like SysML. So that's, that's my thesis or my, uh, uh, my, my guess as to what's happening. Uh, but if there's somebody that wants to disagree with me, I, I, I think there is room for disagreement. Uh, it's certainly simpler than SysML. It doesn't have the, uh, the parametrics. It, uh, there's a number of uh, elements that it doesn't have uh, that are useful in a full systems engineering life cycle. Uh, but I, uh, what, what they've trimmed it down to, I think, is quite attractive uh, from my perspective if, if what you're focusing on is the architecture, the system architecture. Um, the fact that it's uh, open license, uh, I'm, I'm never quite sure whether it's truly open source or, uh, or just an open license. I, I think I've seen uh, 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 on the website that it is actually open source. I haven't attempted to uh, uh, plug anything into it at this point. Uh, but I've always believed with students that uh, we have to be able to give them free open source software to learn the concepts. Uh, then they'll apply them on uh, you know, any sort of project they get involved in, and they don't have to worry about paying license fees in order to start to learn how to use a tool. Uh, the commercial versions can come later once they're 
uh, employed uh, at an organization and the organization can, can put the full-fledged tools on their desktop. Uh, but uh, the fact that it's open, open license or open source means that it is going to have a very large user base um, and there will be tutorials like mine and other resources uh, uh, being built over time. Um, I'm also familiar with Eclipse-based products, and I, I'm, I quite like the Eclipse framework. Uh, I know that it leads to very robust uh, graph-based architectures. Uh, then as I, I went through the, you know, as I was going through Capella, I have my own favorite diagrams that I use for systems engineering, and quite a few of them are present uh, in Capella. And if they're not exactly present, there are ways of mimicking uh, those diagrams, and I'll come to that later in the presentation. Okay, so uh, it checked off quite a few boxes for me, and, and uh, so that's why I had the enthusiasm, and I hired a postdoc, uh, Uru Arakan, to uh, develop the first version of the tutorial, and he did a fabulous job. And then uh, after teaching with it one year, I came back and I revised the tutorial, but I stuck with the basic structure that Uru had, had created. Uh, so these are some of the diagrams that are possible with Capella. Uh, and uh, these are all useful in both systems engineering and systems architecture, in my opinion. So we'll, uh, we may illustrate some of these as we go through. Okay, so again, uh, to set the stage for the tutorial that uh, we developed, uh, my target audience was junior, uh, uh, junior year engineering students. So they've all had an internship, uh, you know, a summer with a company. So they've had some work experience. They've done some project work. Um, but for, for the most part, they're coming at all of these topics cold. Um, so. Uh, there, it has to be a simple introduction, and we have to be sort of trying to indicate the value of these steps um, as we go through the tutorial to convince them that you know there's a reason for going through all of this work uh, in developing a model. Uh, and I made the decision base, basically uh, the time constraints we had within the course. Uh, I can get through the first three levels. So we will stop at logical architecture. We do operational analysis, system analysis, and logical architecture. Um, for my, my money, that gets some of the major design concepts across to the students. Uh, going the next level to the physical architecture, I think, can wait uh, for a subsequent course, or they could pick it up on their own. Uh, but I have had people uh, in industry ask me, uh, when, when am I going to develop the tutorial uh, for physical architecture? So if there's enough pressure, I, I may, may do it for the external audience. Uh, but it doesn't buy me anything internally, because <laughs> we won't get to it. Um, and then uh, I chose, uh, uh, again, wanted to teach the, the tool using a, a very simple example. And I've been using the, the idea of a toy catapult for uh, 10 years, so uh, I've, I've got a lot of diagrams and uh, descriptions of uh, a process for designing a toy catapult. So we uh, basically repeated that here. So um, I, I wrote a book some years ago and based it on the toy catapult example and we're uh, uh, going to continue it here. It's nice because uh, it's, uh, it's easily understandable by uh, everybody coming at it. It's not intimidating at all. And, uh, but you, there's still some discoveries to be made. So as you go through the process, you, uh, you will discover something. OK, and then uh, this past year, I've added some additional uh, sections to the tutorial because there are these other diagrams that aren't natural in Capella, but there are ways of, uh, uh, of displaying uh, them, and I'll, I'll mention those at the end. Okay, so we've now, uh, so that's really motivation for the tutorial. Uh, the, uh, I'd like to give an overview of the tutorial. I'll, I'll probably be going through this fairly quickly, uh, but you know, the, the whole purpose of this webinar is just to get you interested to, to go and perhaps invest the time yourself. It takes several, it takes many hours to go through it. So, 
we, uh, I have uh, maybe four hours of lab uh, where the students are required to go through the tutorials. And I don't think in four hours they finish everything, but uh, they're required to finish it uh, for, for a homework assignment. So, you know, uh, uh, book at least, uh, book several hours uh, to get yourself through the tutorial. So here's the landing page that you'll get to. You'll see a picture of the toy catapult or a commercial toy catapult there. Um, and uh, the credits there, again, I have to give credit to Uru Erikan, the, the postdoc who, who really uh, created the structure of the tutorial and, and really and, and added uh, all sorts of uh, 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 interesting quotes and other things to it. So he did a beautiful job of uh, setting up this uh, tutorial. Okay, so the, uh, the, the second uh, page uh, is a getting started page and it covers uh, basic instructions that you'll need uh, to install Capella. Um, and it's, it's aimed at the PC. Uh, we have quite a few students with Mac computers uh, so I've had to develop some separate instructions for that. Uh, if, if you want uh, those instructions, please email me and I'll send you a copy of that file. Um, we'll get around to posting those uh, later. Okay, and I think that first getting started just gets people used to uh, working with Eclipse, uh, setting up uh, projects and so on. Okay, next major, oops, sorry. Uh, 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 next major category is operational analysis. Uh, this is a fairly long tutorial because uh, we're teaching student, you're, we're teaching everybody the basics of drag and drop of all the different components. Uh, we introduce actors, operational entities, uh, get the idea of a mission statement, uh, uh, identify what required capabilities our users have, and then. Uh, just walk people through a scenario creation process that uh, it seems difficult for the students going through it the first time, but uh, it's the neat thing or the interesting thing about Capella is you're really repeating that process in every one of the layers as you go through. Uh, so it's worth spending time uh, to do it in a very simple setting. So, for example, uh, we, you know, are, we have a very simple mission. We uh, want to amuse a three-year-old grandchild and create an opportunity for a parent and child to play together that delights both the parent and child. So we're setting up something like an, a mission statement, an operational capability uh, node uh, with two actors, a child and a parent. Okay, and by the time you're finished, uh, you get uh, this uh, basic architectural diagram that shows uh, what, what is the child doing and what is the parent doing and what are some of the interfaces uh, uh, between those uh, functional activities. So there's an operational architecture uh, that you get to at the end of that uh, portion of the tutorial. <clears throat> now, I, I'll take a side moment here that uh, there's uh, there's different language. So uh, you know, I, uh, you know, coming from my systems engineering background, I use the word use cases a lot. Um, but uh, in Capella and Arcadia, they don't talk about use cases. They talk about scenarios. Um, uh, but scenarios, uh, if you think. You know, so I'm now trying to teach according, I, I'm trying to adapt to the language as well. So a scenario can include a journey map, uh, which is, you know, just understanding what uh, a day in the life of the user. Uh, but when you do more detailed systems analysis, you'll transition to what we would call use cases and, uh, and think through uh, those use cases in detail. Uh, but a second thing is that in describing scenarios or use cases, uh, Capella uh, biases you towards using sequence diagrams. And I just have, you know, th this is idiosyncratic. Uh, I prefer activity diagrams with swim lanes uh, to sequence diagrams. And uh, so I ended up redoing the tutorial. And uh, Uru, the first version of the tutorial, he did it with sequence diagrams. Um, but I, uh, 
you know, I came back and for, for my comfort level, I redid it with activity diagrams. So I've, uh, so I'm surprised the Capella people want to talk to me because uh, I'm, I seem to be departing from the, the mainstream here. Uh, but I've adapted Capella to tell the story using activity diagrams. And then it's quite easy to generate the sequence diagrams once you've done the work of creating an activity diagram. So what you'll be seeing uh, uh, mostly are the activity diagram approach. Okay, so with systems analysis, we start with the idea of your required capabilities and then using use cases, you're going to uh, drill down and try to understand what the system functions are that need to be accomplished uh, and then end up describing a system's architecture. So we start with uh, diagrams that look like this, where we have a mission statement and then uh, a couple of core uh, scenarios. Uh, so if the child is, is playing with the toy, that's one scenario. But then if the parent comes, what's the parent going to do that's different? Well, the parent's going to do something more interesting with the child than what the child might have thought of. So, and then we have a safety one as well. Uh, so here's where I've used uh, activity diagrams with swim lanes, and it's quite possible using Capella uh, to create diagrams that look like this. Uh, and once you've created this type of diagram, uh, then it's easy to uh, you know, go over and create the sequence diagram, which is the, the default uh, Capella approach. Uh, so this is the child. I put the system in the center, uh, the user, the child on the left, and then other systems or other uh, uh, elements over on the right. Uh, so you see the projectile being a, 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 an element that we've identified, we've discovered as uh, needing to be in the system. Okay, uh, so that's the basic swim line uh, way of doing it. And then if the parent got involved, uh, I was thinking, well, the, you know, the parent might do something creative like uh, having a toy train come around and trigger the catapult. And, and then uh, the child would get all excited waiting for the train to come and, and trigger, the, uh, trigger the launch. Um, and one nice thing about doing this is that there's really a discovery there. It's a design discovery. So by thinking through that scenario, you suddenly come to the realization, well, you know, we're going to have to trigger this catapult from two different directions. Probably the child would use a downward hand motion uh, to trigger it, and that's if we left the designers alone, that's probably the trigger mechanism we would get. But by thinking through this other scenario with the parent, we realize it might be useful to trigger it from a different direction, from the toy train passing in a lateral direction. So I'm making the sales pitch that thinking through using scenarios is a design principle where you can expect to have discoveries. Okay. So that's sort of built into the tutorial is those kinds of uh, those kinds of ideas. Uh, and at the end of that at the end of that tutorial, you have a systems architecture. So you've identified all of these functions, and there are pathways through those functions describing the different uh, uh, functional chains uh, that you've identified through your scenario analysis. So this is the child playing with the uh, system. And here's the parent uh, triggering the, uh, uh, the uh, or setting things up so that the toy train uh, does the actual triggering. Okay, so uh, uh, next major one, I, I see I'm getting close to my, uh, uh, my time limit here. Uh, logical architecture, you're going to chunk the design, uh, chunk the functions into logical groupings. Uh, and then we take students through a basic modal analysis and then get to a summarized uh, logical architecture from that. So here we chunk it. Uh, there's going to be four major subsystems to our catapult. Uh, we have to have some way of storing energy, some way of containing the projectile, some way of uh, triggering it, and then some way of actually transmitting energy to the projectile to launch it. Okay, so based on that, now we, ex again, I go back to the swim lanes, uh, the activity diagram with swim lanes. I open up the logical system and put in swim lanes uh, for each of those subsystems and then lay out um, uh, this uh, activity flow, uh, the different functions that are going to get triggered and the interfaces uh, between them. 
uh, and do that for both of our, so we do that for all of our scenarios. And uh, then we also step through a state uh, analysis or modal analysis. And uh, one of the reasons for doing this is our students are going to take a simulation course in the next semester. Uh, and so I want to pick up on the, this concept of state changes and how you can now build analytical models once you have a, a, a state change model. Okay, and then when you're all done, you get a logical architecture and it fits on one page because we have a simple, uh, simple system, a toy catapult. Uh, your bigger systems, are, you're going to have to worry about nesting uh, to a greater extent. Um, and you can have, again, uh, the different pathways, the different functional chains uh, through the system. Okay, that's the uh, using the train now, uh, but uh, going through and visiting all of the subsystems. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up here. We, we do not cover physical architecture. I only sketch the main steps that are involved in it and sort of point students to uh, more advanced materials uh, to, to understand that. Uh, there's a section on document generation. I think this is one of the cool things that you just push a button and you can get uh, full-fledged documents coming out. Uh, in particular, I'm trying to uh, get all of the students to uh, become comfortable with HTML uh, uh, descriptions of their model. And uh, so the, one of the tutorials will show you that, uh, that feature. Uh, and then finally, this other thing I've added this year, uh, there are a couple of diagrams that I like, a concept diagram, concept classification diagram, and an influence diagram. They aren't naturally part of Capella, uh, but uh, I can still uh, use Capella to create diagrams like that uh, by using the class diagram. So here's an example of a context diagram, again, just built from a class diagram. Uh, here's a concept classification tree, again, using the class diagram. And here's an influence diagram, again, uh, just using the class diagram. So uh, it's uh, so even though Capella doesn't naturally support those diagrams, I'm showing students that uh, they can uh, create these kinds of diagrams, and it's in part of their project. I will require them to create these kinds of diagrams using Capella, so that they're now part of the system model. Okay. So we're, uh, I think I'm three minutes over, uh, but I'm going to blame that on our uh, technical difficulties. Uh, a couple of extra, a couple of resources for you. Uh, there are two, uh, two books on uh, using Capella. Uh, I haven't, I haven't delved into those deeply, uh, but there's the link for our tutorial. Uh, it's at uh, the esd.sctd.edu.sg website, and it's uh, part of the general course description. Okay, I think I better yield the floor back to uh, uh, Danny. Okay, th thanks, Peter. Um, we we don't have any questions. Uh, uh, we just have a, a, a remark from Stéphane Bonnet. Actually, um, uh, Stéphane mentioned that in the latest version of Capella, there is uh, an improvement on functional chains, and now you can create uh, seconds and control links, and so in this way you will be able to have uh, functional chains very close to uh, actual diagrams. So oh, okay, great. This is something. I think he will have the opportunity to to uh, explain in the in the next webinar in September, the describing the the new features in, in Capella. Okay, excellent. Okay, and in the meantime, uh, feel free to to ask your questions. Uh, we don't have uh, any, actually. Uh, I think okay. I, uh, I, I saw my colleague Leon McGuinness uh, was one of the participants here, so I'm going to do a <laughs> shout out to Leon, uh, saying okay. hello and thanks for, thanks for joining. Uh, Leon has done wonderful work with SysML, so I uh, hope I didn't undercut his efforts too much here. Yeah. So we have a first question from Jacob Mazur. Uh, any plans to create physical architecture 
even if it's out of scope of students courses <laughs> uh, yeah that's that's what I'm a, uh, I have it, there's no strong incentive because I, I don't think I can use it in the course um, so, uh, if, if there are enough uh, people in this audience that uh, think think that would be valuable I can try to find some time to, to add that but, uh, you know, at this point, I don't have uh, I don't have firm plans to create it. It, it would be natural to, to try to do something on that on that order. Okay, next question from Dory. Have you tried OPM ISO uh, 1950 as a simpler alternative to SysML? Uh, what was the alternative to SysML? ISO 19 uh, four, five, fifty. No, I assume Doug yeah, will no, send not you aware of that at all. Information no. about this. I, the only the alternative to SysML, I, I used to use uh, Core. I taught Core to our students at Cornell, um, but then once uh, SysML seemed to be taking hold, I switched over and started teaching SysML. So those are the only two real systems engineering modeling languages I've used. Yeah. Okay. Next question. Oh, I can I can easily answer it myself. Uh, yes, the tutorial is uh, freely available. Um, yeah, the link. Uh, yeah. yeah, link is on. Uh, uh, I guess it was only up there briefly. Yeah, the, the link was mentioned in your presentation, but uh, the link is also listed in the. Uh, with all the, let's say, the material related to Capella on the Capella website. Okay, great. Um, okay, next one. How do we manage the trustability of requirement coming from stakeholders? Um, uh, that I haven't, uh, I, I didn't do a lot of uh, work on uh, requirements. I, I really focused on functional requirements uh, as part of the scenario analysis. In other words, as you develop the scenarios, you develop functional uh, blocks, uh, and those are functional requirements for the ultimate system. Um, so I haven't, uh, I haven't explored um, formal requirements uh, development beyond that using Capella. Certainly with SML, uh, we, we did a bigger effort on requirements management. Okay. Do you cover control in your course? Uh, if so, how is it approached? Uh, uh, the answer is no. We do uh, multi-objective optimization. So. Um, trying to show students how to explore a large design space uh, using optimization techniques. Um, control is more covered in our simulation course, um, but again, not in a uh, not in a mechanical engineering context. We do system dynamics and uh, um, uh, agent-based modeling and uh, discrete event simulation. Okay, and okay, do you offer Capella tool training? So you already answered it at the, at the beginning of your presentation. Okay. Um, yeah, there, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm think there's interest here in Singapore at the uh, Defense Science uh, and Technology Agency uh, to adopt something like Capella for, for their projects. So, uh, so I think I think it's going to get uh, used in uh, a lot of architecture uh, concept uh, building uh, projects. Okay. Oh, the model could be validated. Uh, say that again, please. Oh, the model could be validated. Oh, how could the model be validated? Um, uh, that uh, that. Uh, oh, good question. That's, that's a systems engineering concept. <laughs> uh, the uh, um, I think it uh, tr 
traces. Uh, so you'd have to go back to the user with with your concept. But but I think the the fact that uh, with your user you can work through uh, scenario after scenario and show them. Uh, uh, you know, if you just show your final architecture model and then say, uh, okay, uh, let's let's show how it how it executes with this scenario. How does it execute with, with that scenario? So the fact that you can show uh, scenario after scenario or covered um, by the uh, uh, by the descriptions, I think would give uh, would give your your stakeholders some confidence. Okay, and probably the last question. Uh, do you think your students will be confused if they start learning Capella and then want to switch to SizeML? Um, uh, well, yes, if, yeah, if it's too quick. <laughs> uh, uh, but what I'm, what I'm seeing happen is uh, they, they learn Capella as juniors. Then they do a capstone design project in their senior year, and quite a few of the students are reporting back to me that they are building couple models to describe and, and manage their uh, their capstone projects. So the fact that they they've learned it, they've, they've used it in a project, and then they use it in a major project of their own volition, uh, I think that starts to ground the ideas. Um, and then once you've got one language, picking up another language, I think, is uh, uh, not as difficult. But if if, uh, if you went too quickly from one to the next, I think it would become a mishmash for them. Okay, so thank you. That's a valid concern. <laughs> uh, so we have a question, but uh, we, are, we are still uh, out of time. Uh, okay. Uh, so feel free to, to contact us or to contact Peter if you have any questions. Uh, I saw that there is some general question regarding Capella, so uh, uh, you can you can send me an email and it would be my pleasure to, to find an answer. And if it's more specific to uh, uh, the course of Peter or the way to use uh, Capella, you can contact him, I, I assume. You'd be happy yes, to do, yes. to do yeah, the that, same. that would be fine. So that's the reason for making it public. Yeah. Okay, so uh, we would be grateful if you if you can give us some feedback about today. And when you will leave the webinar, you will have a, a subsection form. Uh, feel free to use it and, and express your opinion about what you you see and and what you you would like to to show. And uh, okay, once again, I would like to thank you all for attending this webinar. And feel free to contact us if you want to learn more. I wish you wish, and sorry, and I wish you a very nice evening. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. Good night. Good night, all. Thanks for coming in. <laughs>